This presentation introduces the concepts of operating systems and some of the key functionalities of modern operating systems. A modern computer system is essentially a system of systems. It consists of a combination of hardware devices, firmware that is hardwired onto the computer, and a lot of software that is used uh, along with the computer. The key components of a computer system includes the central processing unit CPU, RAM or random access memory also called the main memory, disks that store the data, and peripherals such as monitors, printers, keyboards, and mice that are connected to the computing system. Modern computing systems are pretty complex devices. They can consist of one or more CPUs, Note that each CPU can have multiple cores in them, which are like smaller CPUs within the main CPU. Computing devices, uh, computers have a number of devices connected to them. This includes main memory, any video or graphics cards that might be on the computer, and a wide range of peripherals like printers and USB devices that are connected to the computer. The design approach where these are a collection of subsystems enables cost-effective manufacturing and separations of concerns between hardware subsystems where each subsystem is responsible for a specific task or specific type of operation. And this also enables delegation of responsibility. That means the printer is responsible for printing, the disks are responsible for storing and loading data, and so on. But the real question is, how do we enable effective use of these diverse hardware devices that are put together to form a computing system? The solution to that is to use an operating system. An operating system is a software suite that is installed on a computing system to enable efficient use of the computing resources. Keep in mind, an operating system is not just a single program, but it is a collection of programs that collectively work together to enable effective use of the hardware resources. Operating systems expose a streamlined application program interface, or an API, these are similar to calling APIs in other programming languages. However, they are somewhat special, and these calls to the operating system are called system calls, or syscalls for short. The syscalls are used for developing software systems. Ultimately, when we write programming language uh, calls, ultimately they all map to these syscalls for performing different operations. Operating systems also provide end-user interfaces um, these can be textual. Uh, often for desktop PCs, there are graphical user interfaces or GUIs that enable monitoring, controlling, and effectively using the computing system. And there are a variety of operating systems that are available based on different devices. The operating system essentially provides two key abstractions. First one is hardware abstraction, that means it provides some consistent interfaces to different devices in material of the underlying physical architecture of the specific device. So typically on a Linux operating system, networks, disks, and other devices are exposed as streams, and it's much easier to work with streams from a programming perspective than to deal with individual hardware. Of course, the operating system manages access rights to these resources and to enables effective use of these devices. The operating system also provides several conceptual abstractions. For example, it provides logical organizations of program and data, both on disk and memory, in the form of files. It provides an API for program development and management of the different devices. It facilitates inter-process communication, may it be through pipes or even a copy-paste operation between different programs is facilitated by the operating system. It organizes data on disks in the forms of files, folders, and directories, so it's easy for us to find and manage files on a storage device. We're able to share resources between different users on a system and improve efficient use of the resources, and the operating system maintains the privacy and security. It also facilitates inter-machine interactions over a network so you can communicate between machines. 
And essentially, it enables the computer to operate in a society of computers so you can join uh, subnets and operate in a subnet. You can think of an operating system as a government which fosters a society in which software thrives. So for example, the operating system will decide the rules by which processes have to share resources. So these resources include CPU time, the RAM or memory that's being used, the disk space, network bandwidth, and so on and so forth. So you can think of these rules as the legislative branch of the government. The operating system enforces these rules. So if a program or a process violates these rules, the operating system will abort the program. So you can think of this as policing or the executive branch of the uh, operating system. The operating system also monitors how programs behave so that it can take uh, appropriate action when the spirit of the operating system is violated. So it can flag programs that violate rules such as malicious software, malware, viruses, etc. So you can think of this monitoring somewhat as a judicial process where misbehaving processes are aborted. A common example of a software tools that are available in an operating system is the GNU Linux tools. So the GNU Foundation, which is, provides free and open source software that can be used to manage and effectively use devices. And the GNU Foundation was established by Richard Stallman, and it's still active, and all the Linux distributions use GNU tools. Along with the GNU tools, there is also a core part of the operating system called the kernel. Most Linux distributions use the Linux kernel, um, which was developed by Linus Torvalds. The Linux kernel has evolved over years into sophisticated and complex software. It predominantly is written in C, but with some assembly to interface with different hardware devices. Uh, it includes a collection of device drivers. These device drivers are sub-modules in the kernel that are used to manage interactions with specific devices. And each device has its own device driver. Linux is a multi-user, multitasking operating system. So it enables multiple users to run different programs or processes on a single computer. Typically, when you work on a Linux machine, you never directly interact with the kernel and almost all of the commands that you'll be using on the Linux box will be GNU tools. Um, so the correct nomenclature for it is GNU Linux, but most people just drop the GNU part and simply call it Linux. Keep in mind the kernel is just a standard C program, uh, so it needs to be compiled. Uh, typically it's compiled with the GCC compiler uh, into a raw binary to run. Um, we are not going to go into the details of this process, but keep in mind there are plenty of resources online that will show you how to compile and install a kernel. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Once you do it a couple of times, it will become very, very simple to do it. Now let's look at the different aspects of an operating system. Of course, at the core, you have different hardware and peripherals that you want to manage, control, and use effectively. So this is what the operating system's kernel does, is it wraps the hardware to provide consistent interfaces for using. And of course, it uses operating system-specific device drivers, which is software or sub-modules that manage the specific interactions with individual devices and peripherals that are on the computer. Around it sit the programming language libraries. So these programming language libraries handle calls into the operating system, also called system calls. So from a programming language perspective, it exposes a simple API. So it looks like we are calling a method, but internally it goes ahead and makes a system call to interact with the operating system. Around these sit the application programs and all of the software tools that enable effective use of the computing system. So different users use different aspects of this. For example, if you're an administrator, you'll use different set of software tools for configuring and managing the system. If you were a regular user, you would use different software to browse the internet, do some word processing, play some games and such on that computer. And as programmers, typically they'll work with the application programming interface of a language and also make direct system calls in order to develop all of these applications, programs, and software tools that administrators and end users end up using. So the programmers have a central role in developing and managing the different aspects of the operating system. 
Now let's look at the functionalities that an operating system provides. First and foremost, it gives user management, where the operating system gives different tools and mechanisms to create and manage different users on a computer. Next, the operating system enables running different programs or processes on a computer, and the operating system monitors and controls these programs or processes as they run on the computer. Operating systems also manage the storage, that means they create those data on disk in forms of files and directories where the data is stored. Memory is an important resource on a computer and the operating system manage memory and they also enable sharing that memory between different programs or processes that are running on the computer. Operating systems also manage devices that are connected to them, so when a USB device is connected, the operating system will detect and load the necessary drivers to use with the device and when it's disconnected it appropriately disables those device drivers as well. So the operating system does all of these activities. In the next several uh, slides we are going to go over some of the details of each one of these functions. The user management is a central component of the operating system. So user management enables adding, removing and managing user privileges on a computer. On Linux, each user is internally represented by a number that's called a user ID or a UID. You can find your UID by using the ID command. So you type ID at a shell prompt and you'll see your number internally that is used to represent your user ID. In Linux, there is a special super user ID which is called root. That's the name of the user. The username is root. And the UID of root is always zero. Linux also has a co concept of an effective user ID or EUID. This effective user ID is to temporarily change the user ID for one or two commands. And this uh, approach is used when you use what's known as a sudo command on Linux. It temporarily changes the effective user ID. All of the programs, files, devices that a user works with are associated with the user ID. So user ID is an important concept that's fundamentally ingrained in Linux. And all of the local users on a system are listed in a simple text file in Etsy password. Linux also permits users to be organized into groups. A group contains one or more users and a user can be a part of one or more groups. Groups enable sharing resources between the group members. Typically, you'll share files. You can also share devices and such between users. So the users can, in a group, can collectively work on a single file or a set of files. So it's easy to share information between users in a given group. Administrators typically create and manage these groups and group memberships. And of course, similar to a user ID, which is a number, group is represented by a number which is called the group ID. In Linux, you can use the groups command to, to determine the groups that you're a part of. And of course, groups for all of the local users can be found in a simple text file called Etsy password. The user ID and group ID essentially provide the security and privacy layers in a Linux operating system. Keep in mind, security is important to ensure the overall machine is safe, all of the network connections are safe, and there are no malicious programs or malicious users on the system. Privacy also ensures that each individual is given access only to a specific subset of programs and data on the computer. For this, Linux runs each process in its own independent virtual memory space, and we look at virtual memory in more detail later on. Files directories have permissions based on users and group settings. And access to devices and peripherals is also controlled. And user and group IDs are used to manage all of the security and privacy settings. Now let's look at the next big function of an operating system. Operating systems facilitate organization of programs and running programs. Keep in mind a program is a set of related instructions and data that is stored on disk. When a program is actually run, the operating system loads the program into memory, creating what is called a process. So what is actually running on a computer is not a program, but a process. And this is a, an important difference between program 
that is information stored on disk, and a process, which is a running program. Process also has state information associated with it. The state includes information like open files, any network connections, dynamic memory that is allocated by the process, and so on. The operating system performs the task of loading a program into memory to create a process. Uh, it also manages sub-processes, which are called threads. And it provides services for processes to communicate with each other. And of course, it monitors and controls the processes and eventually terminates the process when the program is when the process completes running. Operating systems can e handle processes in two different ways. One is called batch processing, another one is called multiprocessing mode. In batch processing, only one process runs at a time, and jobs or processes do not get interrupted or switched out. They keep running, and the idea is to maximize the CPU usage by keeping the CPU busy. Job batch processing is used to typically run non-interactive jobs because interactions with users is very slow and it tends to waste CPU cycles. So batch processing specifically is used for non-interactive processes. And a batch process owns typically owns all of the resources so it can use up all of the memory, CPU time, and peripherals so that it can run, run quickly, and finish quickly. However, typically on desktop machines, operating systems run in multitasking mode. Here, many programs are run simultaneously, and the operating system constantly context switches between different processing, permitting them to take turns at using the CPU. This process of switching between processes is called context switching. Special hardware on the CPU and the computer enable effective context switching. So typically, if there is input-output operations that are being performed by a process, it will be context switch, and the I.O. operation will be handled by special hardware on the computer. On multitasking systems, multiple processes are run at the same time, and of course, multiple users may also be using the machine, and processes take turn at using the CPU, and the operating system kernel handles the task of context switching between different processes and different strategies are used for performing context switching to enable equitable and effective use of the computational resources. These kinds of multitasking systems are typically used for interactive jobs. Um, so you would usually see most of the modern desktop uh, operating systems that have a GUI interface use this kind of a uh, multitasking strategy. Of course, multitasking operating systems are complex to develop and to administer. In Linux, these processes that are running are organized in the form of a tree. Each process in Linux has a parent process called ppid, and, a, and each process also has a number or an ID called a pid associated with it. The picture shows, for example, uh, the sshd um, has a process ID of 47 with its parent process is in it with, a, with its PID equal to 1. In Linux, the root of the process tree is always the init process. This, is, this init is synonymous with the operating system's kernel, that's, which is the first program that's run, and it always has a process ID of 1. So in Linux, the way the computer stops or reboots is by stopping as been in it, and keep in mind, when you stop in it, it kills all of the child processes that are associated with the parent process. So when you kill in it, all of the processes on the system are stopped, and the machine halts or reboots. Now let's look at the storage management capabilities that operating systems provide. Operating systems have to deal with a wide range of storage devices that might be attached or connected to a specific computer. These include like CD-ROMs, DVD-ROMs, or solid-state disks or hard disks for reading and writing data. And each one of these devices have different storage capabilities, different file systems that are on it. The space on these storage devices is typically organized into files and directories. So here, in order to organize them into files and directories, a file system module is used in the operating system. 
the file system is just a software that stores data onto these devices in special formats. Operating systems can support a variety of file systems. So different operating systems have different file systems. So depending on the device and depending on the operating system, they will use different types of storage mechanisms. But at the end of the day, you get to work with files and directories without worrying about some of the details of the storage. In Linux, typically the file system is organized with a slash or the root. And under root, you'll see a variety of subdirectories. The first one, this, notice the difference. There is a slash root directory, which is the home directory for the super user. Typically, user files are stored in slash home directory. And there is a directory called slash dev, which exposes device files for raw direct access to the hardware. And all of these different directories have specific um, organization and specific set types of files are stored in each one of these subdirectories on the Linux file system. This is just to give you an example of how file systems might be organized on a specific computer by an operating system. The next function of the operating system is to manage memory. Memory is an important resource and the operating system spends considerable time in managing memory that is used by different processes that are running on a single computer. Memory is a critical resource on a computer, so an operating system is designed to extend the real or physical memory to provide what is known as virtual memory. Virtual memory is a complex concept, and it consists of a combination of RAM, plus storage, which can be on disks. The idea is to provide a trade-off between speed and cost, where RAM is very fast but more expensive than disks, which tend to be slower but less expensive. So the operating system tries to use a combination of physical memory, uh, RAM, and storage to try and give processes as much memory as possible to operate. Processes are typically run on an operating system using virtual memory references. So typically processes will never directly interact with physical memory. They only interact or work in virtual memory. So all of the programming languages, when they create pointers and such, they are working with virtual memory and not with physical memory on modern desktop operating systems. The hardware here assists mapping between virtual and real memory uh, as the program runs. Before we get into a little bit more detail on virtual memory operations, keep in mind a processor's memory is organized into three key regions. That is text or code memory that stores instructions. This is typically read-only memory for a process. Uh, that is stack space that is used for calling methods and passing parameters to methods. And of course, heap memory, which is, where, which is dynamic memory that is used to store dynamic data like strings and array lists or vectors in memory. Now look, let's look at how virtual memory management works at a very high level. Virtual memory is used uh, to provide a trade-off between speed and cost by using storage. So when you look at programs, consider here two processes are running. They have their text, they have their heap and stack space. So there are two processes, one shown in light green and another one in yellow. The, all of the processes work in virtual address space, so all of their pointers and all of the information works in virtual address space. However, the actual data is stored in real or physical memory. Notice that different pieces of the different processes is not stored contiguously in physical memory but can be interspersed. So you will see the data for the green, light green process and the yellow process mixed together. Then the question becomes how do these map to each other and that is where the CPU's paging module comes into the picture. This is a hardware device which uses a special lookup table called look aside translation look-aside buffer that maps virtual memory addresses to physical memory addresses. The operating system essentially sets up these mappings so that the hardware can appropriately map virtual addresses
to actual physical memory addresses. In addition, the operating system can also store some of the data on disk and it periodically moves the data from disk into physical memory um, whenever the process needs to use this information. So the process of moving data between memory to disk is called swapping. And swapping does impact performance of the system, so the operating system tries to minimize swapping so that the computer can operate efficiently. So let's look at some details on the translation look-aside buffer, which is an important hardware component. This is the component that maps virtual memory uh, addresses to physical memory, and the translation look-aside buffer is set up and managed by the operating system. The TLB is uh, somewhat similar to a hash map in a programming language, except it's implemented in hardware, and it typically is organized in different forms on the CPU to enable lookup and mapping of virtual memory to physical memory. Uh, this concept uh, where the operating system works with the translation lookaside buffer is called a page table. So the operating system maintains page tables for each process and the page table is periodically changed. Whenever a context switch happens, this page table is also switched on the CPU. The operating system populates each uh, the page table and the TLB with entries for each process. Every process has its own TLB, which is, and the operating system constantly switches the TLB on the CPU when context switching happens and different processes run on the CPU. Now let's look at the device management capabilities. Computers have a variety of devices. These include non-detachable devices like um, USB video cards um, and any hard drives that may be physically connected to the computer. Computers may also have peripherals like monitors and printers that might be connected and disconnected periodically. The operating system essentially uses device drivers, which is again software, to handle the specific intricacies of interacting with specific devices. Typically, these device drivers are provided by the hardware manufacturer because it's the hardware manufacturer that knows some of these peculiarities of working with these devices. Typically, we never interact with the device drivers directly. There are programming language libraries that provide additional layers of abstraction so that we can use these devices in a portable and interoperable manner. One of the key ways these devices work in modern systems is to use what is known as asynchronous interrupt-driven input-output operation. In this type of operation, the CPU typically does not uh, do the actual input-output operation. Instead, the CPU delegates the input-output operation to special hardware called input-output controllers that are available on the, on the specific device or the computer. So the input-output controller performs the operations and then once the operation is done, it lets the CPU know the operation is complete by raising an interrupt. And these interrupts are special hardware signals that the computer uses uh, to indicate to the CPU that certain types of input-output operations are completing. We're not going to go into the too much detail into asynchronous or interrupt-driven input-output operations, but typically computer engineers would operate at this level of detail. Now, in summary, let's do a quick recap of the different functionalities of an operating system. Operating systems enable user management to create and manage users and their privileges and their security settings. They also enable running different processes on the computer. And keep in mind, in multitasking, multi-user operating systems, many users can be running different processes simultaneously. Uh, operating systems enable storage management by to store directories and files on disks using file systems, which are software components of the operating system. It also em enables memory management. Uh, specifically, it enables virtual memory, which consists of a combination of RAM or main memory and storage disks. Operating systems also enable device management which enable managing different devices that are connected to the computer. And device management includes uh, managing device drivers uh, 
in order to interact with the specific device that is connected to the computer.